as you all know, um, these Motivation Monday conversations are all about normalizing the human experience along the journey to medicine. Um, and, you know, forgive the technical difficulties, but this is all born out of the movement that GABA currently has to make everyone aware that you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to be this cookie cutter person in order for you to be able to be successful in the career to medicine. And so hopefully having these conversations with folks that have done it will inspire you. So excited for our guest, Gary, who's done amazing things. Um, both in medicine and outside of medicine around racial equity, particularly. And hello, you're here. We're here. Hold on. Let me just fix my screen. Okay. And let me, let me like set some stuff up here. Okay. I feel like we both, are we good? Yes. <laughs> we, <laughs> we made it. <laughs> How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Let me see. I'm, I'm so good. I'm so glad that you're here. And after a, such an amazing talk yesterday. Yeah, great. Oh my God. It was so great. Um, so y'all don't know this, but Dr. Cherry is taking over the world one conversation at a time. <laughs> And I'm going to not even try to explain all the magnificent things that she's done um, and give her the floor to really give a little bit about her background um, and then roll right into that, that awesome question, which is, what was your journey to medicine like? So let's do this. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Magla Sherry. Most of my friends know me as Maggie or Mag or Dr. Sherry or whatever. <laughs> Mag, 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 make it happen. <laughs> so, um, but I'm a board certified internist. I practice internal medicine um, in the primary care setting. Um, and I was actually in academia for three years after residency. I'm a proud DO. So I went to the DO med school in New Jersey. Um, I had got my master's before that. And then I went to UConn for internal medicine with a distinction in primary care because I always knew I wanted to do primary care. And then following that, I went to the academic space. Um, did that for three years. We'll talk about that. But um, <laughs> I will always say that my passion was always uh, delivery, healthcare delivery, primary care, healthcare delivery, how I could bring my expertise and really just imagine primary care differently. Mm -hmm. Practice, although I loved inspiring students, I loved the academia part. I knew that I wasn't getting the thrill that I wanted in the primary care part and I wanted to do more. I wanted to reach my patients more. So I was like, what can I get for additional training? And then I was always following the Commonwealth Fund Fellowship and Minority Health Policy because I saw a lot of their graduates were doing some amazing stuff um, mm -hmm. for the Black community for minority health. So mm -hmm. I applied. I'm there now. So I'm finishing up the later half of the fellowship year, which is one year at Harvard University. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, other things about me or what I do. I'm also the creator of the Not Just a Black Body campaign, hashtag Not Just a Black Body. Background, it came about um, out of some tragedy. I lost both of my parents to the pandemic, um, to COVID-19 in the pandemic. My father would die first and would die not just from COVID complications, but also from um, just the hospital. Non patients are dying disproportionately. So seeing what was happening and seeing the narrative. So everybody kept talking about black people can't get COVID. It's not really real. I was like, uh, it's very real. It's very me. real. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. that's what the movement became about. And specifically, as I was leaving the hospital trying to advocate for my father, because typically when anybody goes to the hospital, I stay there mm -hmm. and I advocate and I'm explaining things. Um, I noticed that they just, it was so haphazard because it's, it's literally like a disaster zone. They're just trying to like plug mm -hmm. things. And I specifically said to the staff, like, I need you to understand he's not just a black body. Mm -hmm. He's a father. He's a grandfather. Um, he's a preacher. He's a lot of things. He's not just a black body and, and value his life as such, just as we do mm -hmm. in our community. Um, so after that, it just really became a bigger movement than just my family's story. Just a movement of we're not just black bodies. Our body mm -hmm. dying. We're being manipulated. We're being abused. We're not mm -hmm. being appreciated. And guess what? Like, I'm not okay with it. So um, that's the movement. I've joined, I've joined with Dr. Jessica, who's a community psychiatrist out of Connecticut, and Dr. Sabrina, who's in New York, who's also an internal medicine doctor, and we're going to be launching some amazing stuff. So follow Not Just a Black Body on Instagram and follow the hashtag. And um, yeah, that's where I'm at right now, just cultivating my voice, um, 
being continuing my path to being authentic in medicine and trying to inspire students and trainees along the way. Yes, I love it. I love it. Now, obviously, y'all are listening. Y'all are hearing all these amazing things that she's accomplished over the course of her career. Um, but you're also hearing, like, the real human journey of having to deal with, like, being in this skin, being of diverse background, family loss, and, and, and having to kind of navigate that. And I think you said a really important word, which is authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering, like, in terms of being authentic in your journey to medicine, how have you had some pushback? with that authenticity? And then what was your journey to really grounding yourself in the reality of your own experience? Ooh, okay, that's a lot. So <laughs> I think it has yeah, when I go natural, I go natural yeah. and see, I've always, if you know, <laughs> my friends laugh, I'm the last one to go natural in the group, essentially. Mm -hmm. Like we will never talk natural. <laughs> her long black hair her silky black hair that's that's the only way to be um fully professional and i bought yeah. in westernized view um and this white supremacist view of professionalism so the the going natural was the breaking point the need to embrace being authentic was really birthed out of everything happening in our world so i would be in med school towards the latter part of med school and in training you know shortly after the Tray trayvon martin situation yeah essentially, and all the things after, and then the white coats for Black Lives were birthed right as I was graduating, going to residency. Yeah. I remember this moment where I was in the hospital, where I'm seeing the things happening on the news in the call room, but no one really discussing it. Discussing it, yeah. It was like the silent, the yeah. Silent. Yeah. No, yeah. Silent. Yeah. And then it was that, it was going, it was like having to hide into the call room to, to understand like what was happening on TV, but then going into the hallways of the hospital and seeing people treat you differently and look at yeah. you differently with a white coat on. So yeah. in mind, I remember specifically saying, there's no difference between the hoodie and the white coat. All they see is black skin. Yeah. So if all they're gonna see is black skin, the conforming, the assimilation, the projecting of what they wanna see is not working. Yeah. And I feel myself. I feel right. like this little part of me that's not mm -hmm. fully me. Yeah. So in that case, like just be me. <laughs> I, yeah, it's simple, but it's also this journey of womanhood and embracing what it means to be bold, be loud, seek yeah. power. We're not allowed to talk about those things, but I do want those things so I can actually make change in the community. And for me, as a person who's of um, Haitian descent, that's also another layer because that's not what I'm told. That defeat what I'm talking. About. In professional school and just really just cultivate this authentic voice mm -hmm. um, but I think it goes down to always feeling like something was missing it was yeah. beyond boards it was beyond grades it was beyond uh you know having the right mentors but something didn't feel right right and feel right is I was doing all those things without being myself yeah yeah so like we talk a lot about on this show about how important it is to really ground yourself in like yourself like run your own race and I think, you know, just like you hit on the head, like, especially for people that are coming to this journey from diverse backgrounds, from the non-white, non-crisp, um, you know, linear background, like that is a factor in your ability to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, I, I just wonder, you know, in having had that journey um, and, and seeing like your diverse patients and what they go through, how do you feel that you being grounded in yourself has actually impacted your ability to, to take care of patients and be successful as a doctor. Oh man. So I think it's helped me tap into, so you get all this training, right? You, mm -hmm. you learn a new language. I tell people the medical terminology is a whole new language. Mm -hmm. So you learn a new language, you know, you learn a new way of comporting yourself and, and becoming this, you know, revered professional and leader, but your community doesn't recognize that. Right. Right. It, person who now she thinks she's better than everybody she's right better, right so then you're torn because you feel and 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 this is something that's coming up a lot too as black doctors are taking the vaccine in this conversation about people feeling like we're traitors right yeah. so you've now had to put on this new mask and this new veil this new language so you could fit in there yeah how do you bring your experiences from before med school so that's what it's been for me this ability to, to just say, okay, I got this knowledge. I'm grateful for this privilege. But now Maggie, and I say Maggie in particular, because it's not Dr. 
necessary. Now, yeah. now tap yeah. into the experiences from outside of medicine. Tap into what it was like and why people respect the church and why yeah. the church, how your hair can help you connect and yeah. that you remember from your upbringing and put that with medical terminology. Yeah. That with what you learned in med school. And that just gives you a whole nother level of being able to care for patients, especially in the primary care setting. So it's more than just how smart you are, your board scores, but your patients don't care about that. They Yeah. They have <laughs> you tell me your board score so I can determine if I'm gonna pick you as my doctor. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Call you on social media and first of all I love that hair. And one thing <laughs> exactly. I said I was about it. Dr. Yeah. Sherry about you at my church. I heard about you from a family friend who said they felt comfortable with you. They felt safe in your office. That is what leads me, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's the part. Like, it's not, it may not make sense now as you're going through training, but even after training, even during training, this is, you are the expertise in being Black. Yeah. You're black. I'm an expert in being a Black woman, my Black woman, right? Mm -hmm. And my womanhood. Bring that expertise to the table and combine it with medicine. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So I'm imagining when you changed your hair, where were you? Are you in medical school or were you after medical I was school? You were after medical school? Sorry, I don't know why I'm having the, te the technical issues I'm having today. <laughs> I cannot. Um, what, was the, what was the backlash like? I'm asking because I know that is like, it's like when I decided to lock my hair, I remember it being not just a conversation with myself and like what I want to do. It was also like I had to consider all these other people. Suddenly, like what I wear on my head is very political. Um, and, you know, you have to kind of fill that in. Like, what was the reaction like? Did you get any, any backlash? Uh, the biggest backlash was my mother. Really? Yeah. And I think we don't talk about that enough. She was like, what are you going to do? Like, are you going to yeah. be professional anymore? You gonna yeah. And you're like, it's not good. And I actually scheduled my visit <laughs> to, to cut my hair. So I cut it into a bob first and like let yeah. that out to yeah. turn. So it was first the cut. She didn't even fully know that I was actually going to go completely now. Uh, to, to do this and he came in surprising me like oh I'm gonna get my hair done too and saw like my hair being cut <laughs> and almost had a heart attack. and almost had a heart attack I bet she was like uh-uh I did not sign up for this I didn't turn around in the chair I was like keep doing it keep doing it so, <laughs> keep, keep <going. laughs> um so that was one of the big hurdles I think at work because I started I, I did it in a way that was comfortable for me so I tell people as you gain your voice and, and embrace your authenticity, do it at a level that makes you the most comfortable. Yeah. You don't have to prove your blackness to anyone. Right. So you want to make sure you're okay with how you approach things. So for me, it was easier to go short. I always wanted a bob. I wanted this sleek A-line bob and see if I could rock that. I looked fly. So I had my bob, which was actually technically half, like partially natural, but you couldn't tell because I straightened it. And then I cutting it and straightening it, cutting it and straightening it until I knew most of it was, was um, natural. And then I would transition completely to wearing my hair natural and wearing froze and twist outs and different things. So that's how I did it. I know my colleagues were like, oh, I love your hair. When I would try different styles, they wouldn't really comment. Um, I had braids. So it wasn't really backlash there. It was more, I actually got it more from my mom initially. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely the confidence grew. So I didn't really pay attention to it. Uh oh, can you hear me? I can oh, have a terrible technical issues. Okay. Um, yeah, it might be because it's raining in Atlanta. Everything goes goes <laughs> crazy in Atlanta whenever there's precipitation. Mm -hmm. um, what I hear in your story, and I think this is so important, is this reclamation of your humanity um, mm -hmm. and you being really grounded in your own identity and taking that and using that in your in your career. Um, and I think about that, particularly because I know a lot of people that listen to this show are here because they have at some point in their journey had someone tell them like, you know, you can't wear your hair like that and be a doctor. You can't um, be it. Uh-oh, can you hear me? Your video keeps breaking up a little bit. Ah, come on, <laughs> come on, come on, internet. Uh, but basically people get messaging all the time that they're not good enough to fit into the status quo that medicine has kind of come to represent. Um, and so for the students that are listening, what would you say, would you, how would you recommend they deal with or maybe prepare themselves to deal with 
those kinds of voices that say they're not good enough. Can you hear me? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Okay, you need me to repeat it? <laughs> I know something about <laughs> saying they're not good enough. That's all I heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the students that are listening, um, you know, having heard people say that they're not good enough for whatever reason, whether it be their hair, their skin, their background, what would you tell them to either kind of tone those voices out or to fortify themselves as they kind of go into the medical field? Yeah, so this, oh, we could talk about this <laughs> Um, so two things have to happen, um, which is what people don't understand the complexity of being black and yeah. brown in medicine and in these, prof and not even just medicine, these professional spaces. Yeah. A lot of people don't have anybody who before us, who went before yeah. us, like family, right? Yeah. So sometimes, so sometimes there's two things happening. Sometimes it's our own personal struggles that affecting into what people perceive of us mm -hmm. so you've gotten there and this is like the topic of imposter syndrome and you think that you're you're not good enough to be there can you yeah. hear me I know yeah. You're, yeah. so you feel like you're not good enough to be there so no one has necessarily said anything to you but right. you're wondering when you enter this room so people don't I mean to, a, con a way to conceptualize it is how many times have you walked into the lecture room and you're counting how many people look at you how many people yeah <laughs> I do it. I, I'm, I'm like <laughs> I walk into yeah. Like, how many black folks? One, two, three. Yeah. Exactly. Five. Like, okay, four. Cool. We're good. Insurance of actually deserving to be there. That quite often yeah. people don't understand. I mean, how many white people do you think have to enter a room and count how many people are there? Like they, that doesn't exist for them. So right. that sometimes that's part of it, and which is why I any mentee that comes to me, we do a lot of work on their background. I want to know where you come from, your culture, because a lot of times you're breaking a lot of cultural norms just by existing in the space that you're existing. And even beyond that, a lot of us, when they come talk to me, they don't just want to be a doctor. They have all these big ideas and vision, and especially for women, that's big, right? Because people just want you to <laughs> make it married and put some babies. Exactly, put some babies in the world. In the world. <laughs> so a lot of them are in this, in the, in this like struggle internally to not only just live out what people want from them, but also do they silence the no, the vision and the passion that exists inside of them? And that's a separate thing. And then now you start saying, am I good enough? Am I dreaming too big? Then there's a factor of, yes, people are doing implicit bias, explicit bias, microaggressions and racist acts towards you, which makes you further devaluate your worth. So there's two pieces of work that needs to be done. The first part is that internal work. So we don't really celebrate that in medicine because once you're in, people think, okay, it's all about grades. No, no, no. You're going to be interacting with humans. Human lives are going to be in your hands. You need to have a good sense of self. And that is articulates into emotional intelligence, right? So you got to be aware of who you are, what you're about, your own biases, um, your own triggers, your own trauma, and how that translates. And that is oftentimes the hindrance that we have as we're in training and in that system. So that's yeah. that. Part. Then the second part is as those biases, racist acts, microaggressions, discriminations happen, call them out. A lot of times they happen and we, you know what we do? Oh, okay, I should expect this. We yeah. toss it. We throw yeah. it in a bucket. And eventually yeah. this bucket of all that stuff happening to you just keeps growing and growing. <laughs> and yeah. you explode and everybody's like, why is she so mad? <laughs> why? why, why? Two. Right. It's not just touching your hair. You have a bucket of microaggressions and racism that's building, right? Mm -hmm. So now when they touch your hair, yeah, you, you're like, yo, I'm over this. Like, this can't <laughs> Right? So right. I, that's, the part, that's the complexity of being Black and the complexity of being a Black student that mm -hmm. happens in, a, or a student of color, I should say, because I think we share a lot of these um, microaggressions and trauma together that people don't understand. So when you're talking about your worth, you are there. Yeah. You are worthy. Yeah. I had to start doing daily affirmations for myself when I was in med school, especially when I got to third and fourth year, because yeah. now I no longer had my whole class where I could find my few black friends. Yeah. Patients. I'm on these rounds and everybody's white or yeah. Asian. And I'm like, dude, I don't look like yeah. these people. <laughs> so, yeah. It's real. And I started shrinking, even though I was a good student, I was excelling. I couldn't present. I would be on rounds and like, uh, and I would stutter. Nervous. Yeah. 
nervous and no one could see my academic capabilities for a minute because I would always like, I don't know if that's the right answer, I'd second guess things. So daily, every time I would wake up in the morning before I left in the mirror, I would say, you're worthy. You're going to be a doctor. You're worth being a doctor. You got this. And speak that into myself and watch myself in the mirror as I did that before I went to my rotations. Ooh, that's powerful. Where were you when I was going through? <laughs> because it's, it's, it's a real thing, especially third year. You know, I remember walking in to take care of a patient on my surgical round. Most of the surgeons that are with my team, they're old white guys or even young white guys. And I was the, oh, I'm with this. I walked in with the surgical team, had a conversation with the patient. And as I was leaving the room with the surgical team, the patient goes, oh, I'm sorry, nurse. And I'm like, no, I just said, <laughs> I just said, I'm with the surgical team. I'm here, but you identified me as the only black female. I couldn't possibly be a part of the surgical team that just introduced themselves to you. Oh, and I, I think, yeah. I yeah. have a better one. I Tell will... it. I, um, third year your resident it's me i have an intern a white male and i have a white male attending really great attending i loved working with him we go in to see a patient this patient i've already so often residents will pre-round before the team so they know what's happening even though mm -hmm. the intern will present but you're always on top of your game so i, I already saw the patient i sat down with the patient i um talk to him about his diagnosis and what we're thinking is happening so now we're on rounds with the attending in my team and uh he's on the phone so he's on the phone talking to his friend. Uh, the intern walks in and the intern, you know, same white coat, same badge, whatever, big doctor badge. <laughs> oh, the doctor's on the phone. He's like, oh, the doctor's here. I might have to call you back. My attending walks in, white male, again. He's like, oh, another doctor. Wow, I have to call you right back. I walk in, white coat, badge, same thing, you know, me. Yeah. And I walk in. He goes, oh, the maid is here. No. It would have taken everything in me to keep my face he said, together. And no one corrected him. No one corrected him? See, I think... So... And afterwards, it, it didn't become a discussion about race. It became a discussion as, oh, it happens a lot to females. It was about race. No, it's about race. It, it definitely is. Off, because he does a lot of drinking or whatever. Actually, if you want to blame it on that, it's inhibition. That means right. that that is what he truly believes right right <laughs> answer call it whatever you want but it is what it is yeah no we would have had to you know it's it's kind of like one thing so naturally i i run gaba and i make a point of saying calling it what it is and i think people don't do that enough um of calling racism and calling these systems of oppression what they are um, and I definitely don't think we do that in medical education. And I think that's why we see the dropout rates and the challenges that we see with our diverse candidates is because we like to blame, or the system at least likes to blame. Oh, these people, students have not arrived in a medical school and worked as hard as they have only to prove that they're not capable. They're highly capable, but there are all these social and cultural things that medical ed education just doesn't address that they have to come back and after this time you get you get burned out you get fatigued mm -hmm. um and that and that and there's just there are not enough candid conversations about that reality at all um and you bottle it up right so i do my training but i mean what i saw in attending hood attending hood which is when you're done um when some of those actions happens with white staff for me and now i'm an attending yeah um i had a visceral reaction like i was mm -hmm. having a panic attack at one time when 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 a white female ma came for me yeah and i remember saying things okay i know i'm mad about the situation but this seems bigger than that yeah the lies was like a combination of the racial trauma that had built up the trauma through training that now was manifesting itself as me shaking in my office yeah but saying wow and that's what led me to eventually seek out therapy and get help because I was just starting on the job and I was like I can't this can't this can't yeah be. yeah yeah like we're not doing that <laughs> yeah <laughs> not today <laughs> no 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 yeah no and I think so it's like you said you know it builds up you think like these things are all oh, it is one microaggression here um I read a quote 
a long time ago and it was like, you know, the thing that really burns you is all the times you have to betray yourself by not speaking up. You don't get to advocate for yourself. And over time, that builds up into a level of trauma that you then have to unpack mm -hmm. on your own. And it's like, when, when, what's the, you know, no one knows what the upper, the feeling limit is on this thing, but it's there. It really is. It really is there. Right. Um, other part of it and too. I love the fact that you talk about like your journey to mental wellness because I don't think that we're honest enough about mental health particularly amongst physicians and in the medical space um have you felt like they're much more candid oh no I'm can you hear me can oh. you hear me now <laughs> So think about how I felt about having more candid conversations, I believe. Yeah. Have, has it, has, are, are we having more candid conversations within the medical profession about mental health and about how yeah. now? <laughs> Thanks. 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 I've been on my page and it's one of my, um, one of my sincere passions to talk about. Yeah. Um, I've used my own journey um, of grieving and what that became for me to share, but nah, we're not talking about it. I mean, that's yeah. one is that I'm extremely afraid of. Yeah. I think mental health workers, uh, our healthcare workers, um, are gonna be burnt. Yeah. And I'm really, I sincere, it sincerely pains me to yeah. see that our country doesn't get it. Like we, I mean, let's use this pandemic. We have doctors who have literally been at this for a year. We may have went into lockdown in March, but they were seeing some shit happen, excuse me, happen in the hospital <laughs> for yeah. a long time and couldn't really speak it because they didn't even understand what was happening because we were not getting information properly, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, I'm like healthcare workers and frontline workers have been at it for a year. Yeah. We didn't know what was happening, but especially in the hospitals as numbers, I remember some of my residents saying, Dr. Sherry, I'm reading up on stuff because something's happening in the hospital. It's not flu. They're not coming up flu positive, but I keep intubating people. I wow. keep getting for symptoms and I'm internal medicine. So we were seeing that a lot. And I was like, really? And I remember one dis distinctly, my resident was like, yo, Dr. Sherry, something not, something not adding up. And she would be right. reading other stuff. I'm like, well, tell me what you find. Cause right. I don't in January and February. And then March is when everything hits. So a year of this, a year of watching people die, a year yeah. of not being able to tell your family and friends what's really happening, a year of you trying to process your emotions and being away from family and not, no, we're not gonna be okay. Let alone with everybody in society, trauma and businesses closing yeah. and financial hardship. Man, if we don't make public health uh, an, an emergency in regards to mental health, we yeah. are gonna die your problems and I hope yeah administration i've been tweeting it and putting it out there. <laughs> it needs to be on biden and harris's agenda yeah and even if you want to take it to the next level think about what happened last week that was traumatizing yeah yeah that was traumatizing for people what? like themselves who saw how a whole a whole group of people got treated differently because let's be real if it was us we would have yeah. left oh it would have oh Yo, oh, no, we wouldn't even have touched the ground. Are you kidding me? That's the capital in body bags. In body bags. Oh, no, it would have, oh, it would have been a done deal. Oh, we, it absolutely wouldn't have been the same way. Body bags. So the fact that we are merely existing after watching that is another level and insult to our mental health. Yeah, 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 yeah. Papa Dudu is saying, you know, healthcare workers after this pandemic, it's going to be like a PTSD, a whole nother form of PTSD. Yep. But if... And, and I would even argue that it's already here. You know, we talk about physician I, burnout. I lived, I tweeted that in my, one of my posts when people were like, oh my gosh, we're so excited about your strength. I said, listen, <laughs> you, want, you want to know what this strength looks like? Right. It's like, I can't remember things. I can't sleep. I can't yeah. hear, I can't do certain things. I'm walking around with a notebook to recall my yeah. memory. Like, dude, like, if you want to celebrate it, celebrate what all of us are going through as we yeah. process stuff, not just the grief, but what we saw. So yeah. Yeah, we just have to have more people have to sound the alarm. I know it's hard because some people are worried about their licenses, their standing in the academic world and things like that. But we need some honest conversations about mental health. We absolutely do. It's not happening. Absolutely. People are starting to talk about it, but they mask it as wellness. That's just nonsense. No, that's a totally different. Yeah. And I... And I... <laughs> Dang, it's like we had like 
because I'm like, that's a totally different conversation. That element, and then it's usually like, <laughs> no, you don't make well what's already sick. We have to roll this thing back, treat the illness, treat the underlying problem, and then we can talk about wellness. And I think we could all agree in the medical profession that there is a sickness amongst medical professionals that hasn't been talked about as candidly as it needs to be. Um, yep. Yeah. I mean, even when it comes to just physician suicide rates, we don't hear about that. And I don't even know what that number is now. Um, exactly. Exactly. And I, I mean, for all we know, that number is even higher, higher than ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you talked about earlier, when you talked about how um, you were able to really ground in your sense of self and in your identity, you talked about how that really changed. That got harder as you got to third year, fourth year, where you didn't have your, your nest of folks that you were going to, that looked like you that understood your struggle. Um, and I feel like that really highlights the importance of building your nest, or like I say, I tell people, build your nest of people that understand. In building your nest of folks, were there things in particular that you considered about, hey, these are the kind of people I need around me for this journey? Or was it kind of just like, hey, just a, a, a convenient sample, or if you will? Uh, building, so I call it building my tribe. Yeah. Tribe, that's how I term it. Um, yeah. And my tribe for me is outside of medicine. Mm -hmm. So I tell my mentees and other people, um, like, who are the people who helped you get here? And granted, I know we talk about some people, you know, don't understand your struggle and it's going to be hard to have certain conversations. But I believe in cultivating your tribe outside of your actual. Yeah. One, I don't think healthcare and medicine should be in a silo. It's one of the biggest mistakes we've had that we've seen transpire in the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one part of it. But the other part of it is there's so much you can bring to people who can remind you who you are when you're they're not in it with you. So my tribe has attorneys, has attorneys, paralegals, yeah. has uh, people in corporate America, athletic trainers. Um, I live and die. The success of Maggie, of Dr. Sherry, is by her group chats who keep <laughs> because she's heavy. And she yeah. will go come for people in the emails. So yes. my tribe on the outskirts, reel me back in. <laughs> before, somebody, before somebody get hurt. Not only reel me back in, but also provide me validation. So a lot of times when I see certain things, they're like, no, Maggie, you've been about that work. They don't understand that. Um, let me, let's help us, let's help you regroup into what your bigger mission is. Um, what, whatever that is, they reel me back in my faith. So when I start doubting, they're like, but you know your source, you know what's important to you, you know what you believe in. They reel me back in in my bigger vision. So when I'm getting confused about where I'm going, they're like, no, no, no. Remember, you always said you wanted this. You always right. said you wanted that. So for, I tell people not only to have that in medicine when you can, but really outside of medicine. Like I have some dope friends and yeah. dope that I know I mean one person I spoke to today she she um she married a friend in my intimate circle um she's a judge I mean and she's 30 she's in her 30s she's a judge oh, in wow. New right exactly yeah. and, a, <laughs> and a Haitian woman right wow. have the most incredible intimate conversations about life and faith and religion and she just got married so we're talking about uh, what that transition has been like for her, just being this intimate circle of dialogue. She's out in medicine, yeah. right? Yeah. And not even just like, I mean, I didn't even know her growing up completely. She married one of my good friends, right? So yeah. it's, you can make new friends in adulthood. I know we say no new friends. <laughs> oh, <laughs> really bad, that's a really bad habit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not even the people outside of your field, but think about as you elevate, as you go to new places, you're going to meet new people. Be okay with that. Be okay yeah. with entering people who not only celebrate you, but love that. And I love that you have folks outside of medicine because it's very much you get this this the messaging that people aren't going to understand what you're going through, but you really do need those people that are going to remind you why you started this journey. Yep. Yeah, I tell mentees, hey, stay grounded in the why. Stay grounded in the why. There are going to be people left and right of you that tell you you can't do it because you got a C on this and a B on that. And you, I don't know, you didn't do 2 million volunteer hours. But if you stay grounded in the why, 
um, and, and have your, your tribe, like you say, to remind you of that why, then that makes the journey less daunting mm-hmm. um, at times. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I know that we've talked a lot about your work surrounding racial equity and justice. Um, and the hashtag not not just a black body campaign, and I love that. Um, for folks that are wanting to kind of get more involved, learn more about that movement, how can they find you? What can we as a community do to rally around that message and 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 keep the conversation going? Oh, absolutely, great question. So um, we have an Instagram page. So if people want to just stay in tune with what's happening, um, go to my direct profile on Instagram. Uh, Dr. Magdala Sherry, right in my profile, you'll see founder of Not Just a Black Body Campaign. They can click on it and follow. Um, our website was up, but we are relaunching with some exciting mm-hmm. stuff and the announcement of our new leadership that's joining me on this movement. So that's going to be releasing towards the end of the month, if not early next month. It's intentionally taking a minute because we want to make sure we do this right. Um, and we want to make sure we can outline where we need help and people can get involved. So especially for med students who are looking for something different to do, um, but also have on their resume to speak to the work that speaks to them, we're gonna have a lots of opportunities to really engage. And we also wanna engage people outside of medicine. That's actually one of our big agenda goals, which is why we're being intentional with the rollout, because we don't want just doctors. We want yeah. nurses, doulas, um, people in law school, people yeah. who are in politics, people who are in social work, people who are in And, and everything in different and not be in a silo. So yeah. the first thing for now is to follow the IG page because we keep that pretty pretty up to date. We'll be launching the relaunch of the website too, soon. Um, and then also on Sundays at eight o'clock, I have a, um, I host a room with the two other leaders uh, on Clubhouse. So if you have the Clubhouse app, uh, make sure you follow me on there and then you'll be able to see when I'm having those discussions. And they're amazing y'all. So if you don't do anything <laughs> today, that is what you need to do on your Sunday. I got lucky. I got to come to one. Uh, and they talk of, of like a, amazing, amazing wisdom about um, liberation and healing and not just in medicine, but just as people. Uh, we got to start talking about this thing as a human experience and not just a medical experience, um, which is what Dr. Sherry is all about. Certainly what we're about at GABA, about building community um, around this humanness of of medicine because that's actually where you get to heal and have an impact on your patients yep. and actually do healing because our system is not set up for healing. It's oh no, right? No. It's set up for money. <laughs> yeah, people under that. Yeah, we've had some discussions, <laughs> okay? But that one, I had my notebook out, okay? And they're like, "Yo, I have three <laughs> late, like near one o'clock." Like actually looking up into, I read the Uche and only black stock article about mm. um uh the, the black panther and young lords movement in the in, in um in in advocacy for healthcare, and i was like yeah, yeah. Oh, this is inspiration i know i was so, like that's how how moved i was from the conversation and not for me but the information that was being dropped and just reminding myself i have so much more to learn if i want to do this the right way because it's not This movement is not about me. This movement is about elevating the voices of those in the community and giving them what they need and what they want and how they articulate how they want health to look, not what I want. So I'm excited. Y'all not ready. (laughs) Take me with you. (laughs) This is amazing work and it needs all hands on deck. I really do think that, you know, COVID, I... COVID is terrible, but I think it forced us all to sit still and really and reflect and pay attention to some really important issues in our country and in our healthcare system. Um, and that, that one, that one is, a, is a huge one. Um, it's not enough to just recruit black talent to our medical programs if we're not taking care of them. And it's not enough to just have black professionals out there if we're not empowering their voices and empowering their ability to create change. Like, yep, it's like, what's real representation? Is representation just putting me on your photo op? Right, exactly. Right. Sitting <laughs> me in the room and asking me, asking me to please impart my knowledge and my expertise as a Black person, as a person who relates to the Black community. And not just mine, because I'm a Black um, woman who's the daughter of immigrant parents, but what about other Black? We're not a monolith. There's, there's so much to our dialogue and who we are. There's intersectionality as well. 
So when we say representation, are you really about representation? Because right. diversity is not just a photo op. It's not. Right. Um, diversity is a collaboration and it's also it's twofold it's you saying not only do i want you here but i want your representation whether it's sexual orientation mm -hmm. race um everything every background you can think about but also diversity in thought diversity in implementation diversity in expertise diversity in experiences mm -hmm. i want that to the table and because i i know your value and your worthiness i not only want you present i want your voice i want you to lead I give you the tools, but you're supposed to lead. And we don't do that enough in academia. We don't do that enough in healthcare. It's the same conforming and I'm, I'm tired. I'm done. I'm yeah, done. yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. And that's, that's what this conversation is about. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm really like, I, I really can't. So folks that are listening, usually around the little, like the 10 minute mark, I start asking for questions from those of you are, that are back and see if I saw something. Um, yeah, Papa Judo is like, it takes a village. So glad that you have your tribe. Um, and definitely stay away from people who drain you. You don't need that kind of energy in your life. <laughs> uh, you don't need that kind of energy. Like, you know, I had a student, a mentoring session a couple of days ago with a student who said that, you know, she had a friend who was really negative about her journey and about her grades. And I'm like, that's not a friend. You know, we yep. got to silence that person. That's, that's not a friend. We got to get that person out of here. Um, and I think that's really important, particularly if you are of diverse background. Uh, let me see if we have anything else in here. About healthcare, we said that one. Uh oh, let me see. Okay, I think I read them all. Sometimes I'm scrolling so fast and I wish, you know, I'm like an old lady looking at this thing because the font <laughs> is like in nine font and I'm like, did I have any more questions in the thing? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm like, let me see. Take the village self-care. Uh, question, what would you tell med students who internalize that they are not good test takers? Hey. Um, all right. Hmm, there's so many levels to that. Okay, so I think the idea of not being a good test taker is a thing, but it doesn't mean you can't get better. Right. So I think it's one thing to accept that and come to the conclusion that taking tests is a difficulty for you, but now we have to unpack what's the difficulty. Is it a mental thing and a mental and emotional mm -hmm. where to the point that you just made you're internalizing that you're not good enough to do well? That's, mm -hmm. that's something we can work through in one. Is there some test anxiety there? Um, do you have some bad experiences with test taking? Is there some trauma related to that? And that's going to probably take the help of a counselor and even a therapist or even psychiatry. And that's not, I'm saying it out loud because that should be accepted. Um, yeah. Your white counterparts often do that. So yeah. in, it's okay to up your study skills. You may be a bad test taker for particular reasons. Maybe you study the knowledge, but you don't know how to apply it. So get help. So yeah. don't internalize a you thing, right? I can't do certain things. I can't play a certain instrument. What am I going to internalize it when I pick up the piano? And I <laughs> do what I like. I don't do that, right? Really right. Want that skill, I go ahead and learn it. It's like being in the right. gym, right? I've never squatted before, done a certain movement. Of course, the first time it looks horrible, but what do you do? You get a trainer. You watch videos on YouTube. You, it's a muscle. I, I, there's so many things in life, whether it's your leadership skills, test taking skills public speaking skills, um, storytelling skills, whatever it may be, they're muscles. Look at yeah. everything as a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. If you haven't used it often, it's weaker, right? So you get practice and you do different things to exercise that muscle. So say, same thing with test taking. Get yeah. practice, reevaluate and assess the situation. What is the issue? Get a better sense of clarity with that. Get help to get you a better sense of clarity and then exercise that muscle to do better. Yeah, I love that. I mean, because these things are not permanent states of being. We hear bad test taker, and it feels like like that was a stamp that they put on your head at birth. Every that's something that's in your DNA. Yep. Um, you are forever prone to this illness, and it's it's really not. It's just it's just a muscle that you have to flex, um, and and push that label off of yourself. Someone asked, "What can a regular run of the mill ordinary person do to further your cause?" And I'm thinking, and I'm going to add to that, your cause in turn is, I don't know if there's a person that's asking that, but non-Black people, allies of the Black community, are they welcome? <laughs> oh, yes. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so if we're talking about the Not Just a Black Body, a further um, push the cause. Um, so just to give people an, a, a background, the background is, you know, I lost my parents to COVID and we know that COVID was this grand thing that lets us see what's happening in healthcare and just the disparities among systems, right? Mm -hmm. So initially we started with sharing COVID stories, which is great, but we're we're still doing that. We're gonna do it in a different These things in healthcare existed. So now we wanna be thought leaders and solution oriented in how we start to fix those issues. So in that regard, everybody's a part of the movement. Just to realize this is this is part of the issue. And one thing I said in Clubhouse um, yesterday in one of the discussions, this movement is geared towards Black people. And I need people to understand that. Um, it's intentionally geared towards Black people. One, I'm a Black woman. Yeah. Two, Black people have been oppressed by our system on many levels, including in healthcare. Yeah. Not with the story of Dr. Susan Moore, who was a Black physician who died not by COVID, but also by the system and mistreatment in the system. Mm -hmm. So it's an even graver, she was a physician, practiced for 20 something years. So it's even a bigger example of how the system has racism, white supremacy in it, right? So we have to address Perfect time. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, so what we're going, so the plan in partly, partially amplifying it, like use the hashtag, not just a black body. If there are stories of patients who are black and brown who have gone through the system, and they had a bat, like something happened. We want to hear those stories because that amplifies our voice and being able to talk about what needs to be done. If people have ideas of how we can partner with community organizations, because we're, we're, I say we take it, we're taking it to the streets. It's getting real grassroots because we don't believe those structures are safe for people to feel yeah. comfortable, vulnerable. So if people have ideas on how we can partner with schools, community organization, uh, religious um, um, institutions to really reimagine healthcare and reimagine how it's delivered in practice. Yeah. I'd love to you. Um, send us a DM, send us a message. And, and, and soon enough, in the next month, we're going to be holding town halls for the community so people can come in, share their experiences, share what they think can also add to the movement, and then we can partake with them how they can be involved. So for now, just continue to watch us on Clubhouse, listen to us on Clubhouse, uh, follow us on Instagram, um, and understand the movement is for Black people. But when we take care of Black people, all people win. Take all people. Hey! <laughs> Not on that word, y'all. <laughs> Dr. Sherry, always an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on this Motivation Monday and sharing your story about how you are able to harness your humanness to transform this amazing career into a powerful mission that's truly going to impact millions of lives. Um, I hope the folks listening walk away from this conversation knowing like you matter, you belong, and don't don't strip away all your color just to be able to fit into the white coat, y'all. The, the coat is white. You don't necessarily have to be. So just say, oh, I know that might be t-shirt worthy. That, that might be a t That a, might be a Right, right. <laughs> And, and I want to add to that as a last closing message. We need you. We need you, but we need you as your authentic self. I don't need you as a conformed self. I need your authentic voice. I need your authentic experiences. I need that. That's what we need on this side because it's not going to be a Dr. Sherry thing. It's not going to just be a one doctor, uh, not just a black body thing. It's going to be a, a collaborative effort if we're going to move the needle in all systems in this country forward. But you got to be that most authentic, real um, in tune self so this doesn't become about you and finding who you are but it really becomes about others and how to move the needle fold forward using your privilege yeah I love it I love it y'all like follow get in contact with Dr. Sherry in the movement um, for students that are listening GABA is 100% free for you if you join after listening to this conversation 100% free I can guarantee it because yeah it's me um, so um, get involved, get engaged, and, and be inspired, y'all. Have an awesome week, and we'll see y'all next week for the next Motivation Monday. Thanks uh, so much. Hi, it was a pleasure. Bye. Bye.